Most respected speaker for the session, Maria Lucia M. Gunto, who is the Associate Professor, Research Director, Sports Psychologist, University of Philippines, Diliman, College of Human Kinetics, Department of Sports Science. She's also a psychologist who's got a PRC license. And uh, she had attended a psychology MA, community psychology, and PhD in social psychology. Her professional appointments are University of Philippines, College of Human Kinetics, is an assistant professor, research director, sports psychologist, technical research review committee member, Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research and Development, one of the uh, UP faculty grant for teaching and public service awardee, outright research grant awardee. Alinea School of Medicine and Public Health, she was a lecturer and mentor from 2011 to 2014. Atuna Center for Organization Research and Development Program Developer and Facilitator from June 2011 to 2013. She's also uh, at the Department of uh, Sports Psychology, Atuna D. Manila University, she was a lecturer from 1989 to 2007, instructor from 2007 to 11. And Versity Sports Psychologist from 2007 to 2011. Philippine Center for Sport Medicine, Sports Psychology Unit, Consultant for Sports Psychology 1994 to 95. Hong Kong Sports Institute, Sports Psychology Unit, Exchange Fellow for Sports Psychology. Atina D. Manila University, Human Resource Center, HRC Training Director. Her professional affiliations are with the International Association of Physical Education Sport for Women and Girls. She is the executive board member, 2019 to present. Asian South Pacific Association of Sports Psychology. She is the managing uh, the managing council, 2014 2018. Treasurer, 2018 to 2022. Women in Sports Commission of the Philippine Olympic Committee, member 2018 to the present. The Foundation of Global Community Health Scientific Advisory Board, 2017 to the present. Special Interest Group Sport and Exercise Psychology. Psychology Association of Philippines was the chair for 2016-17 and a member from 2018 to the present. Psychological Association of the Philippines, fellow 2011 to the present. Association of Sport and Exercise Psychology of the Philippines, founding member 2012 and present. Continuing education, child protection in COVID pandemic, capacity building for social workers and community service providers. The science of well-being at the Yale University online certificate course, fearing, angering, and depressing as a call for growth and healing, Psychological Association of Philippines, online counseling opportunities and risk, Psychological Association of Philippines, telepsychology during the COVID-19 crisis, ethical and practical tips, Psychological Association of Philippines, mindfulness interventions in sport, an interactive workshop with the Federation European D Psychology, the sports, the activities, uh, couples, Applied Exercise Psychology Workshop, facilitating mental skills delivery among exercise instructors, reframing good character, strength-based positive psychology interventions to promote character development in sport. Applied Exercise Psychology Workshop, facilitating mental skills delivery among exercise instructors, the growth mindset, professional conduct in high-performance sports psychology, cultural competence in high-performance sports psychology. I think um, it's, uh, her, her, her resume is too broad. She's got in-depth knowledge. Madam Maria, indeed, we are very fortunate during this pandemic. And uh, with all, the, we had a series of sessions starting from June till today. But then one of the most important aspects was the mental health, which I will touch upon. So we are indeed very, we are, we feel it's a blessing. And this program, we are honored to have you as the speaker. On behalf of the Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports, Government of India, Halo India, and lecture by National College of Physical Education, a warm welcome to our most distinguished speaker, Maria Luisa Junto from Philippines. Welcome, ma'am. Okay. Hello. Um, good evening to all of you. 
Um, I'm very privileged to be the last um, speaker for this series of uh, international talks, and I am most uh, fortunate to be in the company of distinguished speakers as well. I heard that you will have your closing ceremonies tomorrow, so I hope that this session will not be anticlimactic, instead even be more provocative in terms of exciting people to continue the discourse of uh, how we might um, really improve our skills and our competencies in PE and sports. Okay. Yeah. Just a minute. I'd also like to welcome our distinguished panelist, Darling Kluka. The light has come in. Warm welcome. Rosa, welcome to you. Beatrice, welcome. And Maria, a warm welcome to you. Kichosa, warm welcome to you. All the members of the members who are participating in this P program and Sanjay, each and everyone a warm welcome. Over to you, Maria, for your session. Yes. So when I start the slides, I will just turn off my video so there will be no interruption on the audio quality. Okay, so I hope that's, that's okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right, okay, so um, good evening, everyone. Um, I will be discussing um, how mental health may be cultivated, cultivated in PE and sports during this pandemic, okay? So um, we know very well that there is this tiny microscopic virus that is affecting the way we live nowadays, okay? And the whole world has gone through a lockdown of sorts, although some countries are stricter than the others, most have really gone on standstill for some time. And um, closer to our hearts, all the sports events, especially the international ones, are canceled, which includes, of course, the, mo the most awaited uh, 2020 Tokyo Olympics. And um, most of us have been um, forced or compelled to stay at home. And this, of course, affects all of us. And it's like the world is temporarily closed. We've never experienced anything like this in our lifetimes. Okay, and then we have what we call the new normal, where physical distancing is the norm now, washing of hands and wearing of masks. Suddenly, we were forced to behave in ways that we were not used to. Okay, so my question to everybody, and I hope that you will type in your answers in the chat box. Is it the chat box or the question and answer? Um, I'd just like you to think of two things, and you, please be very spontaneous. There are no right or wrong answers. The first question, I'd like to know, what do you miss most about your pre-lockdown life? Can you like uh, type it in? in the chat box and we will ask our co-host to read some of them maybe after one minute okay so i'll give you one minute to type in what you miss most about your pre-lockdown life okay so, will it be Usha who will read some of the responses? Uh, yeah, um, uh, it is, um, can you just, uh, I'm sorry, I'll just bring it to you. Some. Are there some, what are some of the responses of the participants? I, I, just, I just tell you, please. Yeah. Uh, uh, daily, one is to be in school, second is job. Third is meeting my students, meeting people, going uh, open, going uh, to the open ground, meeting relatives, sports, my school and students, and um, um, uh, group workouts, freedom, our friends, unable to play, physical activity and school students. I miss my sport ground, my students, missing meeting people with our working, my game, activeness, family and my parents, the sport we played, spending more time with families, my freedom to move and um, uh, move and evening walk, spending time with our family members, running, 
um, meeting with kids in the school. We missed practical life and we updated ourselves in social life. Free air, playground, students and social life. I miss my game session, interaction, democratic life. Of course, the field, my sports life and children, sports ground, field activities, sports activities, learning. Now it's learning new things is a blessing. Family, um, physical activities with students, practice, basketball court, training the kids, freedom from playing, uh, meeting families and friends, shopping, free movement, meeting friends and family, sessions with my students, attending person, going yeah. to school. Yeah. Okay. okay. That gives us an idea. Good. It's like um, there's really an avalanche of memories of what you really miss um, with our pre-lockdown life. Now, my next question is, what do you appreciate most about your lockdown life? Um, if, if it has loosened up in India, it's okay. But what is it that you tried for the first time now or experienced for the first time that you actually appreciate? Okay, so maybe we'll give you another minute and then Dr. Usha can read about 10 or 20 responses. We begin. Okay, no right or wrong answers. All right. Okay. Could you read some responses? Sanjay, can you read? Yeah. Yes, Sanjay will read. Sanjay? I think to appreciate value of life, family, value of life, family, online training, what life is, online courses, meeting with my dear students, on mute, webinars, DC over the a lot of online classes. Learning things through online, most especially on training. Uh, remote maximum time with family. My school family is. Okay. Most of the things online courses. All right. Okay. I think that's also a good idea that we have a lot of things to actually uh, be thankful for. It's not really all that bad. And um, there's just really a distinct uh, know, um, difference between what our lives were before and now that we are in this uh, pandemic, okay? I'm going to also bring everyone to some form of poll because I'd like to find out how everybody is, okay? So um, I'm going to ask Pranesh to flash, okay, um, the next question, okay? Pranesh, are you there? Ranesh? Okay. Okay, so here are some um, questions and I'd like you to respond first to item number one. Over the past three months, how often have you felt the following? Number one, trouble falling asleep, staying asleep, or sleeping too much. Kindly click um, one of the three choices to describe if you had experienced trouble falling asleep, staying asleep, or sleeping too much. Okay. You click, uh, wait. Um, Ranesh, do they have to respond to all before uh, submitting the, uh, clicking the submit? We're doing that. Yes, because we click on, should we click on? I'll be I, I think you have to, to click submit when yes, you're yes. done with everything. So yes, we're clicking it as Pranesh, can you like scroll um, so that the second question... We can, we can scroll it. Okay. The next question is, over the past three months, how often have you experienced little interest or pleasure in doing things? So choose... Um, among the three choices, rarely or never, sometimes or always. Okay. Um, Pranesh, can you scroll? I can only see the top of item number three. I'm not sure if everybody is seeing the same thing here, but could you please scroll so that everybody can see the next item? 
Once they click the first question, yes, they are Okay, so everybody just scroll and then um, answer the, the nine. Okay, there are nine situations there. Okay, and then when you're done with the nine items, click submit. Okay. They have to answer all the questions. And, uh, okay, so if, if, if you are seeing already um, that most have answered, all right, we will close the polling. And will you kindly show us the data? Okay, may I see the data, Pranesh? Pranesh, sir, want to see the uh, ma'am, want to see the data. Okay, so once once the responses have entered, Pranesh can flash the uh, summary of the data. Okay, shall we stop the polling for a while? So. I think we could stop for. Okay, he said that responses are still coming in. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll just put a limit and then we will look at the data. Yeah, please stop it already, Pranesh. Okay, so could you please show us the data? There. All right, so for number one, trouble falling asleep, staying asleep, or sleeping too much. So we have um, majority experiencing it sometimes. Little interest or pleasure in doing things, 49%, uh, that's almost half um, experiencing it sometimes. Poor appetite or overeating, all right. Okay, almost half again, have felt it one time or another. Feeling bad about oneself or that you're a failure or have let yourself or family down. Well, this is good, rarely or never, overtook sometimes. Feeling tired or having little energy, um, more than half um, sometimes. Feeling down, depressed or hopeless, rarely or never, um, more than half. Trouble concentrating on things like reading news or watching TV. Okay, almost half also have experienced it. Moving or speaking so slowly or being very fidgety or restless. Okay, um, so half, rarely or never. And then thoughts that you would be, be better off dead or hurting yourself. Okay, so majority, rarely or never. Okay, so... Why are we asking this question, okay? Because um, um, during COVID, all right, mental health is definitely threatened, okay? And these questions are more or less um, going to give us an idea about the mental health of an organization, school, or even a country, okay? So these are some of the red flags that we normally look at when we are trying to assess the mental health. And across most of these experiences, a lot of us here um, participating in this seminar have felt, um, have felt this one time or another. Okay. Now, these are normal reactions during abnormal times. While they appear abnormal during normal times, during this, this pandemic, this become the norm. All right, so there is no worry to feel that you might be an, um, undergoing abnormal experiences. Now, a lot of people are asking, why can a microscopic virus affect mental health? Does it really attack the mind? Well, it's not as simple as that. 
because of the, the uncertainty, because of the fear that is generated, the panic and um, the stress, people are realizing that the greater impact of COVID is really on the mind. While not everybody will be physically um, assaulted, let's say, by COVID, it seems that we are experiencing what they call collective stress, where simply reading the news or hearing about what's happening is already affecting our mental health. So I'd like to, to, to um, explain um, the experience that most people are undergoing, especially of our students and our athletes, by using the framework of the stages of grief. Because in reality, we actually lost something. We lost our sense of normality. We lost our sense of protection. We lost a lot of things, especially for our students. Suddenly, they can't go to school. Our athletes can't play their games. And I felt that these uh, the stages of grief, and I've read a lot about it, sort of helps us explain. Now, why is it important for us to be able to explain to ourselves and to our students and players what we might be going through? Because once we articulate, once we label, once we are able to put a name to what we're experiencing, it, it, beco it becomes uh, lighter because we are able to talk about it. So how does this look? Okay, so for instant, instance, when the coronavirus was first announced early in March for many countries when the lockdown started, a lot of people were in shock and denial. It's like, it can't happen to me. The, this virus won't affect us. And later on, because of the quarantine and the lockdown, people were getting frustrated. Okay, the students and the athletes were getting angry because... In their minds, you're making me stay at home and taking away my activities. So from shock and denial, it goes down to anger. And then because this anger can be very, very difficult to hold on to, there's some sort of what we call bargaining, where people in their minds will start negotiating. Okay, for instance, if I social or physical distance for two weeks, everything will be better, right? They ask their teachers or their parents. Not, well, this won't take too long. I'll just have to obey, and then things will get better. And it didn't get better. In fact, it's more than 100 days now for many countries that are still on lockdown, okay? And so our emotions go even lower, and many already start experiencing depression. For example, our players, the season is canceled, and my athletic career just ended. That is very depressing for a lot of our students and our um, amateur and professional athletes. And although this is a very low point in their lives, eventually, okay, with the help of others, they will learn to accept that this is not something that's just happening to me exclusively. This is happening to everyone and I have to move on. And of course, ideally, we want them to move where they will be able to find meaning in what they're experiencing, where they will start asking the question, what is the meaning of all this for me? And so when we talk to our athletes and our students, we ask them, at what point in these stages of grief or change, radical changes in one's life, are you? And so when they're able to name it, like, oh, I'm still under depression because I can't get over the fact that this is my last playing year and I just missed the chance. And a lot of our student athletes actually got affected because we were in the middle of the biggest collegiate league in the Philippines. And it was in the middle of the semester when the lockdown was announced. And they really felt this very, very intensely. And so being able to talk about this begins the uh, conversation with coaches and teachers. And then the question that I always get is, is this a linear thing? Like when you're, for example, in acceptance, does it mean you'll never feel bad again? Not necessarily. Because, for example, when you've already accepted it and the whole thing still prolongs and you find out like somebody dies or, you know, uh, maybe a big reunion or 
a big uh, event is canceled and you thought that by September, for example, or by August, this will be already over and it's not, and you were looking forward, then you can slip back again to being angry or being depressed. So this is just a guide, but it is not a one-size-fits-all framework, okay? It's just to help us start the conversation with our students and our athletes, okay? So at the bottom of this really, is to assure people, ourselves, our colleagues, our students, our athletes, that it's okay to not be okay. We don't have to pretend, nor do we have to try so hard to feel good when we're not, because these are normal reactions to an abnormal situation. Okay, so how do we now move into teaching and coaching for mental health? Okay, because prior to this pandemic, we were very clear that we were training the bodies of our uh, students and athletes more than we were training other parts of their, uh, of their personhood. Okay, but before we begin, we must realize that we have to take care of ourselves first. Now, if you remember when, we're, when you're in the air, airplane, the crew would always remind us, whether in a video or face-to-face, uh, uh, -face, that they will tell us, please place the oxygen mask on yourself first before helping small children or others who may need your assistance. And that's in every flight. So self-care is a moral obligation to those who dare to care for others. It is not a choice. Another way of explaining this is about charging our phones. We wouldn't want to let this happen to our phone. So we can't let it happen to ourselves either. So self-care is a priority, not a luxury. You wouldn't want to be low bat in facing your students or facing your athletes when you coach or teach them. So we need to start with ourselves. Okay, so wait, yeah, did you hear me there? Okay, so we need to check our battery. We need to assess, not judge ourselves. So meaning to say we have to be able to reflect sometime during the day, can be early morning or at night, where we can check ourselves. Are we feeling great, feeling okay, struggling, okay, or empty? And this takes a lot of practice because we are not used to it. We're used to jumping out of our beds and rushing to work, okay? So self-care isn't about being selfish, all right? These are two different things. It's not about telling people, me first. It's really about me too. When we take care of others, it includes ourselves. We're not putting ourselves ahead of others, but we are also taking care of ourselves together with others. So whether it's our family, our classes, our teams, we need to include ourselves in taking care of other people as well. Now in the Philippines, this is quite um, a, a concern because nobody wants to be called selfish in the Philippines and we normally put others first, okay? So I always have to remind uh, teachers and coaches that you need not put yourself ahead, but you have to include yourself in caring, okay? So self-compassion always precedes compassion for others. We cannot be compassionate to our students, our athletes, and even our families if we do not even practice self-compassion. Okay, so how does um, caring self-care for mental health look like? Okay, I'd like to propose the following. And these are the things that we do, but we don't do it mindfully. All right. So, of course, we are very aware of exercise and physical activity. But during quarantine and limited movement, this might be kind of tricky. And because we're a coach or, for instance, a parent or a teacher, we, we kind of say oh because i'm teaching i'm moving anyway but during the lockdown this might be compromised so we need to be very mindful 
that we are moving throughout the day and we are active, okay? So the WHO, for instance, um, proposes that we have to have breaks throughout the day. If we are sitting down for eight hours, it's going to really compromise our health. So they introduced what we call the short, intense physical activity for three to five minutes, taking brain breaks or physical breaks between our sitting down behavior is totally uh, better than just having one big workout in the morning and then sitting down the whole day. Okay. Then we also have to um, think about our nutrition, okay, the quality and the quantity of our food. Now, for many people, for example, in our country where food is a problem, well, this is really a big concern. And then, of course, the quality of sleep, because when you are um, mentally unhealthy, it usually shows in the quality of sleep. Either you oversleep, undersleep, or have disturbed or intermittent sleep, not complete in the night. So we need to look at this because once these uh, components are, are um, what they call this, are not regularized, then it will really lead to threats to our mental health. Then we have to look at our daily routine, okay, that we will have to simulate our routines prior to the lockdown or at least be sure that we have a routine, not just let the whole day pass doing nothing. So I normally um, ask people, when you wake up in the morning, do you fix your bed or you leave your bed unfixed and lie down anytime during the day? Because you, uh, some people will say, I don't want to fix it because later on I'm going to take a nap. So by fixing your bed when you wake up in the morning, it's like you're telling yourself, I'm done with sleeping and I have work to do, whether it's school work or your academic work or coaching. All right, so have a daily routine so that it doesn't slip away and you feel like you've done nothing. And then, of course, part of your daily routine will be to connect with people. Studies show that social connection is the biggest protective factor for mental health in a pandemic. So this is very important. And because we do not see people face to face, we need to make sure that we have real connection, not just likes in uh, social media. Okay, because those are not real connections. We have to be very careful about that. And of course, because social media is where everything happens, our work and connections, so we can actually overdo it. And many of the fake news or um, the, the anxiety provoking um, inputs or messages that are passed by people happen in social media. So we need to be able to temper that. We need to treat social media as a form of consumption. Just like eating food, if we eat the entire buffet table, it's really gonna give us upset stomach, get us fat and overweight. The same with social media. If we consume too much of it, our, our minds really get cluttered. It's like having mental indigestion before you know it, all kinds of emotions, really like a roller coaster. And then we have to make sure that we are continually learning. It's not just because this is our profession, let's say, PE teacher or coach, then I'll just stick to it. It's always good to expand our learning, maybe learn a new language. In fact, there are so many universities now offering free online learning. And let's take this chance, you know, because that's going to also exercise our neurons and expand our, our repertoire. So that's very healthy to do that and it will also keep us away from intense emotions by keeping ourselves and our minds busy and then we also would like to encourage people to practice mindfulness which is actually being fully aware of the present moment without judging now normally we take a lot of uh, training to do this but if it's the first time of our athletes or our students we normally ask them to focus their attention on their breath and stay with it because our young people nowadays have difficulty really with attention. And so part of it is doing a lot of mindless behavior throughout the day. Scrolling forever in social media is such mindless behavior. And there's so many things like multitasking that really generate a lot of mindlessness in terms of the way we do work every day 
and the way we carry ourselves. So being mindful, taking one task at a time, being able to enjoy each moment, savor the food we eat, or even the air we breathe, okay, is really very healthy for our minds. And then um, on the left uh, lower corner, I put here humor because again, research also shows that humor is very healthy. Actually, they have a lot of research shows who have been, um, uh, what we call this, so given um, dosage of funny movies and um, really uh, what is exposure to films that are humorous have a better chance really of getting well than those who just watch any form of movie or films. And then, like what I mentioned a while ago, have self-care, which at the heart of it is really self-compassion. To know how to be kind to oneself is a very important skill that we all need to know, especially teachers, coaches, and parents who want the feeling of being to able to give everything we have to our children or our students and our athletes and, and not leaving something for ourselves. So self-compassion is at the heart of compassion for others. The ability to be kind to oneself is really one of the hallmarks also of mental health. Why? Because it means that we are not harsh with our expectations of ourselves and we are able to appreciate ourselves much more than simply demanding that we perform and that we always do um, better than what we want to be. Okay, and then, all right, I put there spirituality. All right, because many cultures, I think also in India, just like in the Philippines, spirituality is integral. So even our athletes and our coaches are very vocal about their spirituality. It's not a taboo in our society. And again, research also shows that spirituality is a very important component in terms of protecting our mental health. So if that is part of uh, your connection uh, with a higher being, then we encourage you to, um, to really uh, nurture this and grow in your spirituality. Is this uh, comprehensive and all-inclusive? Certainly not. But these are the things that psychologists and sports scientists have found out to be very helpful in terms of caring for our mental health. Okay, so what is self-care? Now, there's also this concept that we have been using in the recent years, which we call the psychological first aid. Once we are with students and our athletes and we feel that there is some threat to their mental health and we are not a mental health professionals, let's say we're not psychologists or psychiatrists, but what can we do as a first response? Now, for those of you who have training in first aid with the Red Cross, you know very well that if there are no doctors around, it's very important to have people who can at least do first aid to stop the bleeding or to stop the worsening of the condition. In the same manner, uh, teachers and coaches are encouraged okay, to grow in their competence um, to provide psychological first aid because not all the time, all right, not all the time there will be a mental health professional around. Okay, so how does uh, psychological first aid go? I'm going to borrow, okay, work in the university where I came from, and they put the acronym CARES to make it easy for non um, psychologists and non-psychiatrists to be able to know how to apply psychological first aid with their loved ones, their students, or their athletes when, they're, when there is a need. Okay, so what does CARES stand for? Okay, so C stands for check for imminent danger. So just like giving first aid, you've got to be able to assess um, what's the wound like or what's the injury like. Here, you may want to contact your students and athletes, especially during the lockdown, for instance, via phone calls, 
SMS, emails, or other forms of social media to see how they are and what assistance they might need. So you don't wait for them to come to us. We reach out. Now in the university where I teach, um, we were actually encouraged to call every student in their class, especially if they're not responding to um, chat groups, okay? So I did this actually with my class. Look at the directory that I can download from the registrar's um, website and, um, and uh, what we call this, um, I, I tried to um, connect with them. Okay, all right, so I'm getting a signal. Um, Sean is intermittent. I hope, I, could, I hope that my audio is at least clear. Now, A stands for actively listen without judgment. Listen with your ears and heart. Active listening notices what is said and what is unsaid. Okay, so the pauses. The, um, are very important. That's why when we're doing video calls or video chat with our students or our players, this is very important that we really observe them and how they are saying what they're saying. Avoid interpretation, analysis, opinions, or advice. Simply listen, okay? Then R is to reassure and inform. Assure them that their reactions are normal under these abnormal circumstances. So that sorts of allows them to relax a bit. That they are not alone nor abnormal. Inform them of what the school or the team is doing to help its students, athletes, and coaches. Okay, so be in touch with the administration, be in touch with even their families and find out where they can get help. And number four, for letter E, encourage to seek professional help if there is a need. Should the student, player, a fellow coach or a teacher need professional help, encourage him or her to seek help. Connect them with the people who could get referrals for them. Now, how do you know if a person needs professional help? Okay, I'd like you to remember the three Ds. D, okay, so three. First, there is an experience of distress. Sorry, it's not on the screen. The people who, who, uh, who are experiencing, let's say, severe anxiety or post-traumatic stress syndrome are unhappy. Okay, so there is an experience of distress. Second, there is dysfunction. Either their schoolwork or their performance or even their relationships are disordered. That's why they become dysfunction in one or several areas of their life. And third, there is danger, either to their health, to their life, or of others if they become aggressive. What do I mean by here? by this one, okay? It's like there's a threat to self-harm which might lead to taking one's life. So that's really dangerous. So again, to review, three Ds, experience of distress, signs of dysfunctionality, and danger, okay? So these three are sort of red flags. If you notice this, then don't try to pursue the first aid. They have to be referred for professional health. And finally, S, support self-care strategies. The same thing that you're doing for yourself, you now need to teach others as well. That is why if you, are, you have very poor self-care strategies, then you will have nothing to teach or model to your students and athletes or colleagues also. So most people need the assurance that self-care is legitimate. It's not a selfish uh, thing or preoccupation, but that it is legitimate and a moral obligation, okay? So the new normal now really boils down to cultivating a caring community. Whether it's within your team, 
or within your class or within your family, we need to be very intentional and very mindful of building a caring community where we start with ourselves to take care of ourselves so that we can be more caring with the people around us so that we can also model and guide them in taking care of themselves because COVID is not just affecting our bodies but clearly it's affecting our minds okay so with that i would like to pause okay to give people a chance to share their insights or ask for clarifications and questions okay I will try to open my video here now, but if it slows down um, my, uh, what do you call this? My uh, internet, I'm gonna like, okay. All right, okay. Wonderful session, Maria, it was so nice. We didn't, we didn't want you to stop it right now. We wanted to, come, we thought that you would continue. <laughs> yes, I wish, but I was looking at the time and I said, I, the, when I ask, uh, when I answer the questions, that will allow me to elaborate more. But I was just aware that I need to leave a few minutes for people to react, to clarify, and to ask questions. And maybe for my fellow panelists to also give feedback or input. Yeah. So I think uh, I, I just take up one or two questions of what, the, what they have asked for. Uh, One of the questions from Shruti is, how do uh, anxiety affect athletic performance? Well, this is something that has been established for the longest time, that anxiety really first tightens the way we think. Okay, It constricts even our strategic thinking. And you know very well that athletic performance involves uh, problem solving and strategic thinking. So when anxiety sets in during a performance or even before the performance, the mind uh, sort of uh, constricts and so do the muscles react accordingly. Our muscles constrict also, thereby changing motor behavior that we really practice for. So it either shortens the, the movement or um, leads to hesitation. So, for example, it's, if it's a speed-based sport or a target sport or a contact sport, a split-second delay in our movement because of anxiety can cost us the whole game or even cause injury. So, anxiety has been established in research also to really have a direct effect on performance. Okay, now the question is, do we remove it? Can we remove it? Well, there's a lot of discussion now with uh, sports psychologists because in the beginning, we were teaching our athletes how to diminish or control thoughts. And we just found out also that by doing so, it intensifies it. So the training now that has evolved over the years is to help athletes um, be at ease with the presence of a range of emotions so that there is no struggle to push out negative emotions and in so doing um, using up energy which would be better off used to focus on the performance so teaching athletes to acknowledge and notice the range of emotions that may be positive or negative with no need to push it out but simply to perform together with it so anxiety, once acknowledged, need not be a negative um, component if the athlete knows it's happening and will be able to, do, to, to adjust his performance so that it doesn't become debilitating. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, what are the new challenges of physical education teachers in schools would face after COVID, I mean, with COVID-19, after we reopen? Yeah, well, I'm not sure how it's going to be in India, but for many countries, there will be no, uh, it, it cannot be returned to full, uh, let's say, contact sports or group uh, activities, you know, where our students might have to be uh, 
uh, distanced from each other, wearing masks. Okay, that will definitely affect uh, the, the range of activities that are, are open to us. But, you know, there are many competitions now that are being held online. Um, uh, I remember um, in Taekwondo, for instance, they had a world championships on the Pumse where the athlete is going to pre-record the best uh, execution of a sequence and then upload it and there will be judges. Now the question is, what about the sparring component of Taekwondo, the, the Kiroki, okay? So now they thought of something, okay? Because the speed of kicks, okay, will also determine the efficiency of the movement. So they have now a world competition where they're going to, um, to judge who has the most number of kicks in a minute in the best uh, posture or form or something like that. So, uh, you know, the different uh, uh, associations or organizations are thinking of creative ways of continuing the competitive aspect of sports, but in a different form, okay? So if you ask me, definitely it will evolve. P and sports, teaching and coaching will evolve. Now, the only question is, how open are we um, in terms of embracing change? I guess that it will boil down to that. You know, even for us psychologists, we're now doing telepsychotherapy. We cannot do face-to-face -face anymore, at least for the, the, the succeeding months. So all our sessions now are online. And it's very difficult because if the client sees us for the first time and they're shy, and uh, they say, oh, can we just, so now I'm just listening to the client on the other end and I cannot see the facial expression, which is very important for us psychologists because how do you assess if we cannot see the emotion that is normally uh, reflected on facial expression? So now you have to, to learn how to be sensitive to the pauses, to the silence, to the volume of the voice, the inflections. So. We're learning a lot, you know, we cannot force that because of all the clients that I saw during this COVID, because I'm a volunteer in the university for the public to come to us, only two out of, you know, a lot of clients who signed up agreed to see me. Most of the time, they just want their voice. So that's a challenge for us. So same with PE uh, teachers and coaches. There will be changes. There will be uh, uh, what they call this um, innovations that will be required. Okay. Yeah. And another question: How do you encourage um, during lockdown? How do you encourage motivate um, the uh, athletes to train during lockdown? Oh yes, this is a question that uh, coaches always ask because they say it's so difficult to encourage athletes, okay. First of all, motivation is based on their goals. If they think that they're not going to compete anymore, if the season has been canceled, we cannot blame athletes for having no motivation to train. So what's the key here? We need to bring our team together to redefine the goals. If there is no season to prepare for, what is now the goal? What does it mean to be an athlete during COVID? Is this all there is to being an athlete? What about, okay, uh, and this I discovered also with our student athletes, okay, in the university. What about going beyond what the team can do for itself? What about public service? So now we have our varsity players producing all these exercise videos that they upload in Facebook and YouTube for the public to uh, become more aware of the importance of physical activity and exercise. So they upload five minute to 10 minute videos that non-athletes can do. And so now they're helping in the advocacy for public health through physical exercise, okay? So that gives them a sense of meaning. And so being fit, and practicing now takes on a different dimension, all right? So that the coach has to help them find a new way of, of perceiving their future, not tied to competition. Because if we force that and say, 
we'll never know when the Olympics, what if it's next year and the other players are, are training? It will not, it will not really grip okay the heart and the the passion of the of the athlete we need to redefine we need to rearticulate this so that it will be a new future because it's a new normal okay so motivation is tied to goals and purpose so we need to define that thank you now the question is uh, for for instance if an athlete has is tested covid positive then uh, what could be done as a friend? Do you think we don't have a psychologist? Okay. What think, uh, yeah, what could the coach and the others do so that um, this person, we know what happens if a person is tested positive. So what would, okay. how could you suggest that? way? Well, if the athlete is still allowed to keep his phone or her phone and be in touch with team members and coaches, it's very important, like what we said a while ago, cares okay so we can only provide mental health first aid or psychological first aid okay we have to first find out okay how they are allow them to express their anxiety etc etc without judging them okay we need not provide answers we need not give advice but you know a lot of uh, clients who came to us um, a psychologist tell us that they don't need people to fix them. They don't need people to give them advice. They just need someone to talk to and to listen to them. And so listening allows the person to clear, okay, the experience in his mind. And by saying it to another human being, they're actually also lightening their burden, okay? So let us not belittle the importance of active listening, listening with our heart and our mind, because that is, that is a big service that we can do for each other. So simply keeping the connection open with a, an athlete or a coach who has tested positive, continually um, communicating that you are there for them, that they can call you anytime, and that when they speak, we don't need to finish their sentence or say, you know what, you just need to pray to God and things will be okay. Allow them, allow them, even if it's so negative, even if they start questioning, you know, why is God allowing this to happen to me? You may not have the answers, but simply to listen will allow them to feel accepted. And that's very, very important. Thank you. Yes, another question is uh, when we talk of uh, seeking uh, psychological uh, um, advice or uh, taking in, here most of the athletes have a feeling if, if, if a person has got a problem, maybe a mental problem, only then they go to a psychologist. So, to a psychologist. But here, when you're talking, even for a counseling, they, are not, they aren't ready. So, how could we put forth that it's for it, anybody or could have, a, it, it, that means any could ha anybody could have an access, it's not an illness which you're called for. So, how would you give us such a sense? Yes, you know what, you know, even here in the um, Philippines, it's, um, it's, um, it's a stigma, okay? When you go to a psychologist, it's like you're admitting that you are mentally ill or you're crazy, okay? So, um, what we try to do is to educate people, okay, that there is nothing wrong um, about seeing a psychologist. You don't have to be crazy. Okay, it's just like going to a dentist for your cleaning every six months. You don't need to have a cavity to go to, to see your, your dentist. And nobody will judge you if you go to the doctor to have your blood test or labs done. So why is that different with a psychologist? Why? Because everybody thinks that having a mental illness is a sign of weakness of character. Okay? Well, that is not true. In fact, as a sports psychologist, I tell my athletes who are very apprehensive in the beginning, and they, they, they even tell me, um, Dr. Marisa, please keep this confidential. I don't want my teammates or my, um, the other teams to know that I am seeing you because they might think that I'm crazy. Okay? That's normal. And then I tell them, you know what? Going to, for a sports psychology is a badge of honor. You need to be a high performer to go to a psychologist because it means to say that your physical abilities are already good, but you want to polish your performance by working on your mind as well. 
to develop the mindset for a championship. Okay? And so, not can go to a psychologist. You have to be a, to see a psychologist. So I change their mindset so that when they come to me, it's really like with pride. But, you know, in other areas of psychology, especially during COVID, people want to keep it a secret. Okay, they don't want me to tell them. Of course, I have an, an oath of, uh, of confidentiality. That's part of our uh, professional ethics. But it's true, no? What you you perceive? I, India in the Philippines going to a psychologist is like an admission that you are quote unquote crazy or weak in character or not disciplined enough to be able to change your mind. Well, I always tell them, why do you go to your dentist? Why are you ashamed to, to admit that you have a cavity? What if I say that you have a cavity in your neurons? Is that so bad? Okay, so I try to like humor them, but and then later on they get used to it. And nowadays it is better than many years back. People now are able to talk about mental health, whereas before it was a topic that will not, I will not be invited to a conference like this years ago to talk about mental health to PE teachers and to coaches because, you know, that's not important for us. Let's see, even this conference. Um, considered mental health. So little by little, we are getting educated. That's great. It's another question is, we find most of the girls, like when you talk about sport, if you get into sport, you can excel. If you have, a, I say you're more free, you aren't submissive, and there's no fear or, uh, but we find in such cases, very difficult to bring them out of the shell. Bring them out of the shell, to bring them out for an excellence in performance. I'm talking of athletes. There's always a fear. So what is the strategy that you could uh, tell? Fear of what people would say. Everywhere there's a fear, a fear of everything. So how would that, yeah. uh, what is that you could suggest us so that, that maybe small things which can actually help? Are you talking about female athletes yes. only? I'm, I'm talking basically for the female athletes. Okay. Well, of course, um, especially in our culture, I think we, uh, we are very similar. India and the Philippines where... Um, girls are not fully encouraged to be active in sports. And in fact, if you excel in sports, there's an unsaid doubt that you might be actually gay or uh, uh, lesbian or any of the LGBTs because why do you want to do sports? So there's still, there's still um, that kind of thinking. And uh, especially for contact sports or even like weightlifting, which are traditionally um, associated with the uh, males, uh, then people normally label you. So part of the fear and the hesitation is deeply cultural. And so it's not just about training our athletes, but building a culture where girls and women are really encouraged without being judged to play sports and to reinforce and to affirm them publicly. So that more girls will look up to them and say, I want to be able to run that fast. I want to be able to lift that weight too, like she does, etc., etc. Now, if they are already players, and I see that there's a lot of fear and hesitation, which is normal, even with male athletes, then we really have to go back into what is the cause of that fear? What are their thoughts and emotions that feed on that fear? And this is a very personal thing, you know? So it's like listening to the stories of how they were brought up, for instance, or what this coach said to them when they were young that stuck to their mind. So it's like we try to, to, to find out what are the reasons that this fear was nurtured through the years and we try to address them, okay? You cannot, uh, you cannot just delete that from their consciousness, but the idea is to acknowledge the presence of those fears. And now how do we strategize in terms of being able to perform despite the fear? So now we need to look at the sources of strength. What are the sources of strength that now can overshadow okay the presence of your fears because you cannot deny it's there but perhaps you have a reservoir of strength competence ability okay discipline that you can anchor your self-concept on and your perception of yourself such that this will now bring you much 
uh, forward rather than be anchored back by your fear. Okay, the fear is still there. Perhaps your insecurity is still there. But now you're going to bank on, you're going to invest more on your reservoir of strength. So it's really like treasure hunting. Um, I call it treasure hunting because it's like we're trying to look for and discover what are the sources of confidence, of strength, and of power, of speed, agility that you have that we can focus our attention on. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Before we have, uh, I ask the other panelists to speak. Yes. May just, yeah, may I now just request to Pranesh to put on uh, Professor Ken Hardman's picture, please? Pranesh? Pranesh? Yeah. So now um, uh, I'd like to introduce Professor Ken Hardman, University of Worcester, visiting professor emeritus, Professor Institute of Sport and Exercise Science, United Kingdom. Uh, Ken Hardman had a career experience embracing school teaching, teacher training, university academy, as well as visiting professorship in institutions in Belgium, Germany, Iran, Japan, Serbia, Slovenia, Spain, Sweden, Portugal. Academic and professional quali qualifications include BA, MED, PhD, Diploma in Physical Education, Teacher Certification, National Teaching, Coaching Qualifications in Athletics, Canoeing, Cricket, Rugby, Swimming, volleyball, teaching related uh, contributions in higher education, having embraced undergraduate master's doctoral programs, postgraduate professional training, as well as recreation, sports groups, and classes. Principal teaching areas have been in the domains of physical education, teacher education, pedagogy, social, cultural, historical, current, comparative, national, international physical education, sport, recreation, and tourism. He has been an expert advisor to UNESCO, WHO, and IOC, as well as the Council of Europe and Saudi Arabia and Kuwait governments. Current affiliation is Emeritus Professor at the University of Worcester, uh, UK. Main focus of research activity has been in comparative international domain of physical education. Demonstrated inter alia in three worldwide school PE surveys, Council of Europe, European Parliament survey projects, and an IOC youth and sport participation project. His publications and academic papers numbers are over 350, comprising authored, edited, co-edited books, monographs, chapters and books, referee conference proceedings, academic journal articles, conference papers, and major reports and book reviews, as well as several journal notes and articles in professionally related publications. He had several international, national, regional offices, including president of the International Society for Comparative Physical Education and Sport, uh, uh, Iskips, FIP International President for Physical Education and Sport in School Section and Chairman of Northwestern Counties Physical Education Association. He is the honorary member of the International Council of Sports Science and Physical Education. Recognition awards include FIP Cross Honor of Physical Education, Gold Cross and FIP um, uh, Manuel Tobina Medal, XP Philip Noel Baker Research Award, XP Distinguished Service Award. Uh, ENSSC Alberto Badillo Award for Longstanding Work in Sports Science and Outstanding Engagement with the Area of Sport Education Service and the Link Award Physical Education Association UK. He has been awarded several fellowship international fellow, Wilbert Gebhardt Research Institute, Germany Fellow of Royal Society of Arts, Fellow of the European Academy of PE and Kinanthropology, and Fellow of PE Association of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. On behalf of the Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports, I would like to acknowledge uh, Ken Hardman, and I would like to inform uh, this August gathering, I just mailed Professor Ken Hardman and he was kind enough. He wanted to be a part of this due to technical problems. He could not. He sent me a 25-page document for this, which he wanted that this should be shared with the entire participants. Once again, on behalf of the Ministry of Youth Affairs, Sports, Halo India, and uh, LNCP, I need to thank Professor Ken Hardman for his valuable service that he has done. Definitely, we have translated, we are translating his whole document in Hindi, and this will reach the entire uh, participants of this PE program. And in addition to this, he's also given a workshop where it's a practical sessions, and, and this his document will be a resource of inspiration for our PE professionals. So I'd like to thank uh, Professor Ken Hardman for his significant contribution. And this will be a memorable one for us because it was almost a dream come true for me. So I need to thank. So Maria, 
we get back to the session, I need to thank uh, Ken Hardman. So I felt because in his absence, I had to thank and I had to send him this video. And it's been a wonderful thing because I had put almost 60 to 100 mails, but I found Ken just responded to me. So I need to really thank him for that purpose. Now for uh, Darlene, your remarks, please. I think this uh, particular session uh, is a fantastic one to uh, put the um, semicolon, not a punct, for this particular uh, event. So um, I noticed that many of the participants are uh, quite interested in the topics, uh, Marisa, that you talked about. And um, you have always, in my opinion, had a, a, a very good way of connecting with people through stories or examples. And um, I think that's a wonderful skill to have. And uh, I hope that you share that uh, frequently throughout the, uh, throughout the world. So uh, lovely presentation. I do have a question for you. And it's not specifically about sports psychology, but how can we use our power uh, as a group to influence or at least have discussions with every, per, every country's fashion industry because this helps, in my opinion, to set what is acceptable for men and what is acceptable for women, even in their physical uh, appearance. Uh, if you remember way back, uh, in the previous century, uh, the U UK had a, a model named Twiggy. And so everybody then sh should look like a twig. And uh, uh, yeah. so there was no, should be no muscles showing on anybody that uh, was a female. And also then we have the extreme for men uh, like an Arnold Schwarzenegger in his prime where if you weren't like this, uh, you know, you were, you were not a man. And so how, um, how can we better influence what then becomes acceptable of, through the fashion industry? Okay, well, you, you brought up a very important uh, point there. And uh, in psychology, um, this is what we call body image, okay? So we have a lot of studies on body image and what it uh, tells about the person. So assuming that people were going for Twiggy, okay? If uh, we were researching at the time, we could ask people to really articulate what is the representation of women via Twiggy figure that has become... Um, really uh, appealing to everybody. So we need to understand why a model's body. Okay, so for example, in the billboards, uh, we have all of these bodies which are very unrealistic, which make girls, uh, young girls, feel very inadequate. Okay, they feel very inadequate because they're not like the billboard figures. So when we have athletes, for instance, who are bordering in anorexia, for instance, um, and we try to find out why they're, they're starving themselves. It's normally um, tied to their body image. So we need to find out what is it about their bodies that they hate? What is it about their bodies that they don't like? And what is their ideal body? So when you're talking about body image, it opens a whole gamut of, of uh, discussion. And so when we are teaching young girls to honor their bodies, we need to begin to find out what their ideal bodies are and how they look at their bodies before we gradually bring them to a point of honoring their bodies, no matter what the shape is. It's a, it's a process, but opening the conversation even for men. Why is it that Arnold Schwarzenegger's body is so appealing? Is it a sign of power? 
a sign of strength? Okay, is that the only way for a man to feel strong and powerful? What is it that in your body that you dislike? Why, why do you want to be like the body of X? So opening the conversation allows people to acknowledge where they are and to see the distortions. Because all of this happen automatically because of advertisement, etc., marketing. Our, our young people are subjected to all these uh, uh, bombardment and without teaching our students to be critical in terms of what they watch and consume. That's why a while ago I said that self-care involves judicious, intentional, and mindful consumption of news, of social media. And this is not being taught in schools. Nobody teaches these important life lessons to our, our students how to watch um, TV and um, Netflix and be critical. It's like we're like allowing our young people to just watch anything without filter and this is dangerous. So these are skills that the teachers and coaches need to be able to um, engage their students with. Body image is one of them. There is no ideal body type or shape and I think a lot of sports scientists are guilty of prescribing this. <laughs> um, if you're chubby, you're not attractive, right? Okay, so everybody wants to have that small waistline and fatless body, okay? Now, we need to be able to engage our girls um, on this uh, kind of valuable conversation, okay? So, yes, darling, thank you for bringing that up. That's really um, very relevant, especially to girls, body image. Yeah, but, but thank you. I, I, I really appreciate you also including boys and men because, first of all, they may have an issue about their own body, but also the, the positive or negative effects that they give to the girls can make a difference as well. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, the saying, we're all in this together, um, unless we live in a bubble somewhere, uh, we have to be social creatures. And so how can we do that, uh, particularly in physical education and sport? Uh, so thank you for that information. Thank you, Darlene. Thank you so much. You know what? We should include that in physical education, the way we look at our bodies, because it's physical education, education of the body. So we need to also include, I think, in our curriculum, um, body image, the examination of body image. Yes, that's a good, good idea. Good idea. Yeah. Dr. Rosa. Well, thank you very much, Marisa. I'm so glad, I mean, for your presentation. Thank you for accepting in such a short notice because I think you have given, wow, a wonderful explanation of certain aspects that we uh, didn't consider before in all the, the presentation we have had. So thank you very much. And besides that, about the last part you said about this body image, in some cultures, and in some, uh, in other languages, there are this is that component is included, and it's called like cultural bodies. So it's in some uh, PE curriculum I have seen that, not in very many. Now I have one question, but I have next to me an expert in sports psychology, and he will ask a question, and then I will ask yeah. another. One. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's great. We don't do that. Okay. Yeah, bring him in. Hello. <laughs> oh, hello. Yes, hello. Yes. Congratulations, congratulations on your presentation. I actually have two questions. Um, my first question is, how can these psychological tools help the parents of the athletes? And uh, how can they help in the evolution of injury recovery? And the second one is, is this quarantine... Uh, Quarantine, sorry, a great opportunity to work on our self-concept. Yes. Okay, so the first question is, most of our athletes are in quarantine at home. Okay, so the first person who will observe their behaviors would be their parents. Okay, and sometimes the parents are part of the problem because they'll say, 
why don't you exercise? So why don't you train? Okay, because you're gonna you're gonna be out of shape. Okay, you are sleeping the whole day and not doing your land training. You're gonna you're gonna like uh, destroy your future, etc. And many of our athletes actually report that that their parents unknowingly and they have very good um, intentions for this actually become the source of uh, stress stress and um, uh, pressure for our athletes so the one thing that parents can do actually is to ask them how they are what is it about the quarantine that's making them sad or frustrated to be able to say uh, to describe your emotions and to put a name on it, like I'm frustrated, I'm very angry, I'm so bored, okay? This this uh, pandemic is taking away my life, okay? We don't have to solve them. Now, the problem with those parents is when we see our children suffering, we want to rescue them, okay? We want to provide the solution right away. No, we don't have to do that. In fact, one of the things that we need to do as parents is to allow our children to experience the depth of their pain and not do anything about it, but be by their side. In fact, I think it was Abraham Lincoln who said that the worst thing we can do for our children is to do the things they can do for themselves. So all of us have the capacity to thrive under these circumstances. Our children, can thrive, not just survive this pandemic. But we have to be there to support them, not provide solutions. We need to give them the safe space to be honest with their feelings, negative and positive, to be able to learn. I I'm saying this because, okay, I have five children, and one of them is a triathlon athlete who's very, very frustrated because he cannot train during this time. He cannot do biking and running and swimming. And he tells me that he feels very bad because he's out of shape and it will take him forever to get back on shape. And so I said, is it possible to start with small things? He said, yeah, you see, I've gained weight already. I've lost the whole litany of complaints and ruminations. And then I said, before you got into shape years back, you were also overweight, right? And he said, yeah, you had fats all over your belly. Yeah, you're even worse than you are now. Yeah, okay, so what did it take you then to get into the momentum of even training for triathlon? How long did it take you? What did you have to fight in yourself to get yourself in shape? And so we got into a whole conversation about it. So the key there is to ask more critical questions than to provide answers to our children, to generate them to think of their own solutions, not to give the solutions, okay? So this, this is a very important in the dynamics between parent and child, especially if we have athletes in our family, okay? And the second question is about, if I got it, if I remember right, this is about body image. Self-concept. Did I, did, do I remember right? Uh, Self-concept, yeah. Is this going to be part of training? Is that what you said? Um, how can this be part of training? Definitely, I think now during this quarantine, one of the things that will really emerge as a very um, uh, intense um, worry for our athletes is really their bodies because the body is their main instrument to perform, okay? So any weight gain or any loss of muscle, uh, what they call this tightness or toneness, is very threatening to the athlete. And because, let's say, a few weeks have passed before they get, pick themselves up to train again and they've gained weight, fat around their belly or you know, muscles that are not toned, it's so easy for them to get discouraged to start all over again. And so, again, going back to my example earlier, we ask them, when was it at the point in their life that they decide to be a competitive athlete? What was their body shape and body condition at the time? What did it take for them to decide and commit to training? So what are we doing? We're treasure hunting. 
we're helping our athlete, our child, to go back in time and remember that treasure inside them, okay, that they can draw from again at this point in their lives. We are not going to give that to them, but we're going to ask them to remember, okay? So that's a very important discipline also of parents because many times we cannot stop it when our children suffer. And so we give them solutions, we give them advice, which is not really going to help them because they need to discover the strength from within. Yeah, I hope I answered your question. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Marisa. Congrats. <laughs> yes, I also have a one. In, in some sectors, right now, there is a so research discussion about e-sports, okay? So, do you believe that with this situation we are living right now, e-sport will be at its highest moment? I will not be surprised because even um, in the SEA Games in the Philippines last November, um, eSports was introduced as one of the competitive sports. And I, and I believe that it's just a matter of time that eSports will be included in the Olympics. And um, we cannot deny that, okay? A lot of people have been alarmed that the growing eSports is really taking people away from physical activity. In fact, when they asked for a sports psychologist for the sports team, no one among us wanted to take it. It was like, oh, where are we going to help them? But you know what? Um, since this uh, uh, esports is really here to stay, in fact, it might even overtake many of our sports. We as adults, teachers and coaches, need to understand, need to study why is it that our youth are gravitating towards esports. What is it, you know? And I remember um, Dr. Yuri of the XP who gave the talk during the the Sea Games about the gamification of esports. He talked about the principles of esports that we need to learn from as teachers and coaches. What is it that excites young people to play esports? It's the immediate feedback. It's the game-like environment where there are virtual competitions like there's no ending, okay? It's not like the physical uh, training where there's an end to training and sleep, et cetera. Here there's none. It's immediate feedback, meaning if you win the game, there's a virtual trophy. If you, if you um, advance, there will be points. And that's exactly what's happening to all of these exercise apps. Even Nike is, uh, is uh, investing in all of these apps or even rubber shoes that has, has, this, uh, uh, has this component where you can actually measure your running skill. What's the principle behind that? It's gamifying, gamifying even exercise and physical activity so that people will get hooked on it. Because we naturally want to have immediate feedback. We also want rewards, even if it's a virtual trophy. So what do we learn from that as teachers and coaches? To give feedback to our players and our students. We need to give reinforcement, even if it's recognition by verbally um, teasing them, affirming them. Because at the, at the heart of, of eSport is real feedback and reward system, okay? Thank yeah, you. I, I hope I gave some insight. I don't know the answers to all of that, but I think that's what we observe is happening now. Yeah, uh, thanks, Rosa. Uh, Beatrice, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Oh. Thank you, Maria Luisa, for bringing this lecture on mental health and physical education sport during the COVID. Certainly, the program that we are now, the physical education community coaching program organized by the Minister for uh, Youth Affairs and Sports in India, has helped us to improve, to improve our mental health during this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. And uh, you know, the whole month, 
for many of the participants and the panelists and the, it was great. Thank you very much. And um, well, Maria Luisa, uh, I have one question. How might COVID affect the future of elite sport? Do you think that uh, we're going to have new directions? Well, definitely, um, because even among sports psychologists, we are already talking about um, effects of COVID on the mental health of elite athletes. We're very concerned about this because uh, more and more we are realizing that um, athletes are not immune from mental health issues. In fact, um, by the very mm -hmm. nature of high performance in elite sports makes our athletes highly vulnerable to mental health issues. And we have a lot of celebrity Olympians who have already come out into the open. We have Michael Phelps already talking about his own rehabilitation process after the 2012 Olympics. And recently, he came out also talking about how intensely his uh, mental health issues have become as a result of the pandemic and the quarantine. So it's like more and more um, athletes are coming out into the open to first communicate that uh, high performance athletes, elite athletes, Olympians are not immune from mental health issues and that it is something that we can all accept um, and be able to talk about without judging each other. So at least in the field of uh, sports psychology, the future of elite sports already has acknowledged that mental health is a legitimate service that we need to provide to our athletes. We do not have to wait for the time for them to experience um, emergency situations um, for us to be available and address the mental health issues of performance sport. Now, because um, the pandemic, which is, has an extended life beyond the um, zero, um, let's say, um, the zero um, goal of all countries to have no, no, um, uh, what they call this, infections, it will change the way we do sports. Some rules will have to be changed, which will now require retooling, okay, retooling of our coaches and of our athletes, okay? What they were trained to do may not necessarily be the same thing that they will have to apply now. So for both coaches and athletes, depending on the changes on the rules of the game or the way competition is held, there will be um, an amount of retraining, okay, amongst them. So I think for all of us, um, we will have to find our way because many of our teachers and coaches so we need to know even the way PE is taught and what are the important components and I really hope that mental health will be part of physical education because there is no such thing as a body without a mind okay so mental health must be integral to physical education so is mental health important to coaching so part of my advocacy is really educating coaches also on mental health not just during the pandemic but in the after providing for instance first aid training okay psychological first aid training for coaches so that they will be able to assess observe and refer their athletes to mental health professionals. So I think these are some of, at least from my lens as a sports psychologist, will be some of the changes that we will see will be happening, okay, in elite sports. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I think before that, Dr. Sanjay has got a question, please, Sanjay. Thank you for question. I just want to extend my heartfelt thanks to Maria Ma'am because the patient was very informative and impressive too. You are the one who has bring the color today in the last session. That you can see the color behind the screen of Rosa. <laughs> so, uh, I didn't hear it quite clearly. So just I would like to extend my thanks to Maria Ma'am. And I also like to extend my thanks to Rosa Ma'am, Rosa Ma'am, Beatrice and Maria Ma'am. Because you have made this talk, international talk, very informative, very impressive. I think all the participants and we also are going to miss this session. 
from the tomorrow. So I would like to extend my thanks to. Sanjay, uh, thank you so much. I know there's a color, Rosa, there's light coming. Maria, for your remarks, please. Maria. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Uh, well, I, I was impressed by your uh, words also. Thank you for this. And uh, you're talking about mental health. And I'm also thinking of two groups of uh, persons who are normally mentally healthy but they are considered mentally disabled or mentally learning disability so it is also very important for them i think to to value them and to give them the right education and to to try to to work for them and to educate them and my my second advice is because we were talking about body image that uh, in dance there is also a very strict uh, regime sometimes for those who are dancing, they had to look nice. But luckily, the, the modern dance is also accepting that bigger women or bigger women, men can dance as well. And so I think this is also considered to be a physical, artistic physical activity. And so for this, we, we have to consider, I think, the, also the same uh, issues as you were talking about. Thank you for thinking about them. Yes, okay, so thank you for bringing up those points to Maria, especially for um, those who compete in para Paralympics with mental disabilities. I think um, we need to bring uh, greater attention to um, the kind of performance they deliver in spite and despite their mental mm -hmm. uh, challenges. And that's really awesome, but we don't give enough press coverage for them because they're not complete, you know? Yeah. And as I always say to my student, it is more interesting actually to watch Paralympics because it is just so inspiring to see people um, perform with um, all of these challenges because it's so easy to be um, um, captivated by somebody who has a perfect body and complete body parts and complete faculties, no? But that's that's just normal. Why? Because if, if you have all of that, you must just really be able to perform well. But what if you don't have one ability? Isn't that more awesome? And so I think we need to bring more attention to the Paralympics in all forms of different able individuals. So that's one in terms of educating our youth, no? So in in physical education, I really hope that our teachers will be more inclusive to be able to bring in all the differently abled students to play, to dance, to enjoy games. And the second point that you brought up in terms of um, ideal body types for dance, I think um, more and more there are different dance forms that are more inclusive. And that's a very positive um, sign in terms of um, shaping the way people um, acknowledge their bodies and accept that anybody can be a dancer. You don't have to be a ballerina or to have a body as, uh, as feather-like as ballerinas to be able to dance and enjoy dance and enjoy your body as well. So thank you for bringing up that uh, particular issue. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Maria, because we, we, we didn't have a practical session. Definitely, we're going to have a practical session with Maria for a dance, too, because we missed that out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah thank yes. you. Thank you. Now, Do Dr. G. Kishore, Dr. Kishore, sir. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Professor Maria Louise Bingo. Am I pronouncing rightly? Right. How do you pronounce your name? Maria? Yeah. Yeah. How do you pronounce your name? Your name. My name. Yeah. Okay. My, Maria, Maria Luisa. And then Luisa. Uh, my nickname, uh, my friends call me Marisa. It's Maria Luisa. Marisa. Okay. But uh, yeah, Marisa is my nickname. Okay. So uh, that's why. So uh, thank you, Madam Maria, Maria Luisa. And uh, it was a very, very informative. You said last but not the least. One of the most uh, informative, relevant uh, in the current uh, uh, situation that are prevailing worldwide and uh, cultivating mental health in PE and sports during COVID-19.
so i would like to you know set set some salient points of your presentation before that the fundamental here is that you know the virus covid 19 corona is of course uh, a, a pandemic causing disease infection but uh, that doesn't mean want to be sad want to make sad anxious stressed or so what makes if you are stressed you are sad you are anxious that means that can be a disease without getting the disease you are becoming disease by becoming yourself uh, uh, in getting into panic stress and sad your sadness is disease so be, be not be, not even though you are not getting the disease many of them are surviving only if you the world population now that those who are infected is 10.2 million and those who are passed away is 5.20 lakhs so when the entire world population is terrific and anxious and except then a few the entire one has become disease but the disease has only affected 10.2 million but everyone because of the mental that that goes gives more significance to your presentation how you can get rid of the real sickness without getting the uh, sickness so not to be to get into sickness by yourself uh, even when you are unaffected so that is what most relevant and uh, here what is the cause of uh, the sickness sadness the sickness or mental ill health can be caused the symptoms uh, fact is is that cancelling plans at the last minute one can get into mental you know stress and uh, mental ill health believing one is a burden to everyone this too you see how relevant it is in the presenters cancelling plans all the athletes sports everyone plans get last moment go uh, last minute it go either cancelled or postponed so it it gives immediate shock to mind and create mental ill health believing one is burden to others so if you become you know you you are not you are not at all your job has closed so it it gives you know it is a, so the the causes of mental ill health that is what uh, uh, professor maria has first i just want reiterating only and uh, then not at all taking proper diet nutrition one important factor once you are stressed your uh, appetite is lost mood swing you become you know moody at times and out of uh, lockdown your mood mood swing is very common avoiding reality you don't want to face reality you are not you are uh, stressed you are not willing to accept the reality that this is a real so it creates mental ill health and avoiding social interaction so these are all the basic factors which can create and these are all created out of uh, this pandemic covid 19 which is alarming situation for uh, mental uh, in mental health and the physicians uh, the doctors who are dealing with that so they are more at job than even the real and along with the other real our health pattern so that is what is something and here the solutions are being said very rightly revealed that you should hear what is required is self care that you are, you have to have the moral obligation social self care is a moral obligation that was a standing word used by and maria so you should one should realize that to have self care is a moral obligation and is a is a priority and not a luxury so if everyone takes care of themselves as an obligation then it is not it should be a priority here so everyone and self care is in selfish you take care of self is not selfish and not me first but me so these are some of the takeaways i have so these are something which should be uh, uh, you know strike everyone that you should not get into panic you are not you know the ones who are affected who are all affected you may also bet but there is no point in getting yourself affected even without getting and getting into all the ramifications as perfect uh, without having it. so the fear out of it the sadness out of it the anxiousness out of it the tension out of it all these are much more worse than the actual uh, the pandemic which is spreading so what are the remedies so self compassion self care uh, uh, self nutrition exercise uh daily routine and the social connect uh social media learning mindfulness human uh, to be more humorous and spirituality these are all the best remedies 
and also the the care c a r e s which is the psychological first aid very important so very important for everyone uh, to be taken care of the, the the psychological first aid so all together i could summarize that this is very very informative and i think it is something to be not only for the, for the physical education of course for the physical education teachers and uh, uh, community coaches they are the one who has to uh, take a lead role here who can spread this message who can to the to the trainees to the athletes to the parents to the families to the society they can do but for everyone both for every individual this is something and also one uh, more i have a some remarks i want from professor maria that the post covid you have said about uh, during covid the post covid we don't know we have almost now this 10.2 billion affected that means uh, into four you can say that around 40 50 million are that family everyone is affected and 5.2 lakhs are all, all over the world who have passed away 5.2 lakhs means maybe into five into another uh 525 uh, are affected seriously affected by the trauma so the post covid uh, some tips would you like to give uh, that those who are affected and those who are this is uh, for them to keep in mind of uh, some some basic uh, you know uh, sort of uh, uh, it is a first aid initially now you need a medicine to be given uh, to keep them you know out of this uh, uh, the other uh, ill effects of it. if you have some remarks kindly to mention to the audience wow <laughs> oh, thank you thank you well that is that's a comprehensive summary it's like <laughs> my talk all over again but yeah thank you thank you for really guesting me in this uh, series of uh, Uh, talks of, with international experts i really feel very privileged to be in the company of all these great uh, speakers who have come before me and um being the last speaker really um also put a lot of expectations on me i must say but um since i was going to discuss a topic that was not going to what that wasn't talked about yet i knew very well that this would be something that would be new to our uh, pe teachers and coaches and i hope that um even um in non pandemic times we need to be able to bring uh, importance to mental health and i guess this is one of the gifts of uh, this pandemic because um one of the forecasts um even of the big organizations like the who the mental health will be the next pandemic in fact when the pandemic started i was really wondering why we are not alarmed with the figures of depression and suicide because prior to the pandemic the records of the who already revealed that we have 800,000 deaths a year due to suicide and every 40 seconds So as I even speak now every 40 seconds there is a suicide that happens somewhere around the globe one suicide for every 40 seconds 800,000 deaths by suicide every year how come the world did not declare a pandemic how come we did not um act the way we are acting now and because of pre-existing mental health conditions these people who were already suffering prior to the covid are even um more suffering at this time and those who were not suffering before have added to the casualty so we're really looking here at bigger numbers of people who are afflicted with mental illness during and after the pandemic so this is really kind of worrisome for me because we don't have enough mental health workers to be able to respond to this uh to this reality that mental health is the next big problem when covid is over because it has been growing already prior to the pandemic and has intensified during this period so i really hope that all parents teachers and coaches will equip themselves at least with first aid uh, skills no psychological first aid because we need to be able to take care of our families our students our athletes under our care 
case. So I guess um, without trying to alarm everybody, I just want to leave us with that awareness that mental health is really a quiet killer. Okay, in fact, that's what they call depression. It's the silent killer in this world. And for many years, that has been the numbers. The world wasn't reacting. Okay, so um, yeah, I hope that's a message that we will all take with us, the importance of our very own mental health so that we will take care of ourselves so we can take care of others as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kishosa. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Marisa, because it was wonderful. Uh, the session was rejuvenating. See, one month of extra heavy work, so now is the time we are re rejuvenating, bringing in mindfulness. Thank you so much, Asha. You brought in a spark. That's why uh, Dr. Sanjay said, there's light behind Rosa. Today only you can see Rosa clearly. So you, the light is coming. Thank you so much. And I think it was looking like a movie. We didn't want to stop it. And um, we look forward to more sessions because there are certain learning. One is self-care. Start loving yourself. I think it's time we do that. And the first aid in psychology is a new. Le it's a lesson to me too. I think that's uh, we talk of first aid in general, but this is something new which I've which I've uh, heard from you. And the three Ds what you mentioned. I think it's wonderful. And uh, um, we look forward to more sessions because this was just the beginning. And um, hats off to you because you have rejuvenated us. And I think this is this session of five to six, something which is uh, helping us a lot to, uh, to come out and to be much better and uh, releasing of those hormones, which are actually making us younger too. Even I, I say that. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> On behalf of the Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports, Government of India, Kelo India. And then you can see, uh, can you see a horse here? Yes, yes. And she's a queen. We call her Queen of Chansi, a warrior. That's how this our college is named after. It's known as Lecture by National College of Physical Education. So on behalf of the principal and all those present here, uh, thank you. I think I need to salute you. Thank you, saluting you. Because we got a free, I say massage or uh, whatever you say. It was yeah. free. We hadn't to pay anything. It was rejuvenating. Really thank you so much for bringing in uh, a thing where we experience. And we forgot what we wear. I think what is Vanna, I didn't even know. And then how did this time pass off? This was something great. So thank you so much for this wonderful session of yours. Looking forward to support from you too, because now I come to know, I, I think I'm sure you'll be in great demand. Thank you. I'd like to thank Darling Kluka. It was so nice of you. I think you along with Rosa helped us to have an international platform and to bring in people to make this a real international uh, platform because I really feel bad. What's going to happen from tomorrow? Will I see these faces, you know? because they really help us. Thank you so much, darling, darling Kluka, because you brought the best, the, the best people in the world to this particular platform. Thank you, darling. Thank you, Rosa. Rosa, in a short time, you are the president, a powerful person. You could manage to get to Marisa in a day's time. Thank you, because of you. Thank you so much, Rosa. You did a wonderful job. And I look forward to joining your organization because I think I'm, I'm trying to learn skills, take the first step from it, and I'll try to get more into it. Thank you so much, Rosa. I'd like to thank Beatrice. Thank you so much. Because always you have something so special. You tell everything in the end you have a question, which is very unique. So I keep waiting when you're going to ask the question. So I think you know, there's something, so you're, some, you're a real genius person. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maria. For, today we heard you. We heard you. We keep longing to see you. We heard you. Thank you for your valuable presence. And thank you, Dr. Kishore, sir, because it is our principal. He's been so supportive. And it was because of him. He says, you know, I've been telling every time you, you ask for a thing, he says, yes, it will be done. So I think there are many more workshops. This was just a starting platform, but we're going to plan out more. And he'll always say, come on, go ahead, because he wants the, this profession to be lifted up. So that's what he's for. So we are really lucky and, and blessed to have him as our principal. So thank you, Kishore, sir. I'd like to thank Dr. Sanjay Prajapati. Thank you so much for being the host. I think everybody knows you. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank Dr. Sanjeev Patil, who's been behind, working behind the screen day and night for this. I really need to thank you, Sanjeev Patil, so much because you never come with a friend. I'd like to thank Pranesh. Pranesh has been excellent throughout. He's been working like anything. So Pranesh, a big thank you and to, to Mr. Prashant. So I think there are so many people whom we have to thank. And also my dear participants, today it's because of you that we get the energy. 
It is because of you we could have this platform. I need to thank each and every participant over here and the invited guests because you who made this, this event a big success. But we have a closing tomorrow, a valedictory tomorrow. I request each one to be present because I'm sure that's where our experts would see what are the feedbacks and we look forward to seeing you. So once again, thank you and namaste. Namaste. Thank you, thank you. Hope you learn namaste. We learn your languages too. I'm going to learn Spanish. Rosine, you're going to tell us. Your, I'm going to learn languages too. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, Marisa. Nice. Yeah. You have something to drink. It was a. It was a <laughs> magic. <laughs> we have my dinner. It was so yes. nice. Thank you. you really enjoyed. It was so nice. I know, I know when you, yes, Rosa yes. brought in a guest. Rosa brought in a sports psychologist, another guest. And no, I, I have to say, well, I, I brought him. I mean, he's my son. He's oh, here. Oh, and yes. Hi. Yes. He's my and, friend. Oh, hi. Hello. And they know each other. Hi, so it's in sports psychology. Yes. Psychology. So. Great. Great. Yes. Yeah. Welcome <laughs> to India. Once COVID gets over, welcome to this institute. Welcome. Nice seeing you. More Thank you. Fun. Great. <laughs> nice Thank you. Nice seeing you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's nice. So, uh, Rosa, hope we can communicate and we can have, a, we'll be having a group tomorrow during the closing yes. function. Yes, we are trying to do that. And well, Marisa knows. I mean, we, we already shared that in our WhatsApp group. And once more, Marisa, thank you very much for making it possible in such a short time. I mean, <laughs> and, and you did it fantastic, fantastic. and different. Which, I yes, I think it was different. So great job, excellent. And yeah. I think all the trainings with your webinars and all the full work that you have now was, I mean, you have it, everything ready and set, all the practice to have the presentation. Thank you. <laughs> I know, but Rosa, you made it a short time. I was worried. She was taking off stress. So I didn't know what could be done throughout the day. Will it be possible? Will it work? So it was a real stress. And uh, our mental health is in a real problem many times. It becomes difficult when it comes to such stress. So anyway, you did. And we look forward to more workshops. Because a lot of questions coming in. And um, we need people and like you. It's, it's a wonderful association with you. It's definitely nice. Especially as sports psychologists coming in. And um, we don't call you a psychologist because a good human, that's the first thing. we are able to <laughs> listen to the problems, we need that. We rarely come up. Everybody that to give advice, am I right? <laughs> you said the right thing, no advice. I think my son will be the happiest person. Look, Mama, what uh, Marisa said. No advices. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'll try to join you tomorrow. Okay. Not try, I'm going to make it tomorrow. You go yeah. to please do comment tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Because it's important. And just for some time, if you can comment, it could be good. Because we would like to have, let people see who you are. Because others, many of them who, who did not attend might be attending tomorrow. So we'd like them to see too. And Rosa, I think once in two months or three months, we should have such meetings where we can at least be on, the, we can see on the screen, am I right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <can> lose touch. <laughs> and, the, and the energy would drain down. We are charged now. Now we charge in a month. We are charged. You know what's going to happen tomorrow? Luca said the same. Luca was exactly. saying what's going to happen after we stop. That's exactly. Fine. I think this has given us lots of experience, but also lots of new ideas. Lots because I'm ideas. also thinking, and also thinking that we could have a practical session by people. You know. If you have the person here doing the exercise or the activity, if the person have enough space, of course, then maybe you can engage more. But of course, that has to be planned quite on time. Yes, not, you know, such soon, but so people know so they need certain space. So that's great. Yeah. So that's nice. So thank you. See you. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>